do it very well. Let's do it very well. Let's do it very well. Glory to Jesus. Lift your hands with me everywhere. Wherever you are here, I mean, wherever you are in this room, on the gallery, under the gallery, everyone online, will you lift your two hands with me this, 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 this time? But Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the power of your presence. It's your love, your reckless love that we choose to celebrate today. And we want you to know that we know we may never deserve your love. But we thank you for the sacrifice on the cross. We thank you because the middle wall of perdition that separates us from you have been pulled down by the sacrifice of Christ. And notwithstanding who we are or what we have done or where we have been, we can stand in your presence to celebrate your love. Thank you for your everlasting, unconditional, reckless love that keeps chasing us, that keeps running after us. And we ask, Father, that your presence will pervade and permeate the heart of everyone and in every place where people are gathered and joined to this service. That your love will be shed abroad in our heart afresh by your spirit. And that healing and deliverances will flow freely in this service. We thank you, everlasting Father. And we bless your name in Jesus' precious name. Somebody say it better. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, if you're clapping, do it very well. Do it very well. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Have you said happy Valentine or something like that to your neighbor? Just say something. Yeah. Praise God. And if, if your neighbor is looking good with Valentine kind of dressing, appreciate it as well. This is my own Valentine dressing. <laughs> I appreciate them. Praise God. Everyone joining us online, I want to welcome you very specially to this service. I ask that you take distractions away from you as we go into the Word of God. In the brevity of the time that we have, we want to speak uh, uh, into, you know, celebrating the love of God and uh, what, what perspective we should have. And at the end of this short sharing, we're also going to pray. And when we pray, there's no distance in the Spirit. So you just uh, be, be very resolute at receiving from God today because I believe that God has something in mind for you. Glory be to Jesus. I said glory be to Jesus. Designed by love for love. That's what I want to share on in the short time that I have. Designed by love for love. All over the world, people are celebrating love uh, this weekend into tomorrow and all that. Uh, you know, uh, the, the people will make a lot of money from it. Uh, some people will get into trouble. Yeah, I hope you are not going to be one of them. <laughs> All kinds of things will happen, uh, you know, about this week. Some people will, will, will get in, indebted this week, yeah, just because they're going to try to satisfy someone and then get into trouble, yeah. Uh, some people, you know, all kinds of things will happen. But when we talk about love, it should remind us of something that is more than all the things going on in our world today. And as a church, we choose to celebrate the love of God as in Christ Jesus. We choose to remind ourselves who we are. Because who you are is what determines what you can do. When you remember who you are, you activate or capacitate uh, you know, your, your, your divine ability to then live it out, to live it out. And that's why I'm encouraging somebody to remember one more time this season that you're designed by love and for love. The one who is love personified designed you. And he designed you to function in his own likeness. In his own likeness. So Genesis 1 and 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion, dominion, dominion. Yeah. Uh, so so you, you, we need to remind ourselves these from time to time that we are created in the image and the likeness of God. And I'm going to uh, uh, look at two scriptures that des describes this kind of likeness that we're talking about today. God created us in his image, in his likeness. You don't even have to be saved to be in the image of God. You just need to be a human being. Yeah. 
Salvation empowers that image. It empowers the likeness to function at an even more higher level without struggle. But first and foremost, I need to remind myself from time to time, especially if I want to enjoy this world and live to fulfill God's purpose for me, that I was designed by love and for love. Designed by love and for love. I was created in the image of God, in the likeness of God, to be able to function like God. And one of the nature of God, uh, that, or, or uh, one way that I'm like God, is that the Bible says that God is love. And I am also love. I am like God. First John 4, verse 7 and 8, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who is love, or everyone who loves, is born of God and knows God. Look at verse, verse 8 there. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. He who does not love does not know God, but because God is love. If we jump to verse 16 of the same first John chapter 4, it says, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. If I want to abide in God, I must make up my mind that I, I also need to abide in love. So I cannot abide or abound in hatred, in bitterness, and at the same time thinking that I'm abounding in God or I'm abiding in God as the case may be. So I need to recognize that being made in the image and likeness of God speaks to Certain nature of God. Certain nature of God. For instance, Genesis 1 and verse 1, the Bible says in the beginning, God, Elohim, that's, that's, that's the Hebrew word, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. The first introduction of God shows us one of his attributes or nature. It means that the God that we serve has a capacity to create. He's a creative God. So every human being was sent into this world to continue the work of creation that God started in Genesis 1. So I'm creative. Tell your neighbor, say, I'm creative. And tell your neighbor, say, you are creative. Yeah. So when the Bible says in, in verse 26 of this same Genesis 1 that uh, God contemplating and saying, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. How am I like God? I'm like God because God is creative. I'm also creative. In the same vein, 1 John 4, uh, verse, verse 8 says, God is love. So, how am I like God again? According to Genesis 1 and 26, I'm like God because God is love and I'm also love. I, I was designed by love for love. I derive from love, so I'm, I'm also love. Are, are you still with me today? I said, are you still with me today? Yeah, very important that we always have that at the back of our mind. That God is love. He does not have love or shows love. God is love. Love is his nature. God cannot but love. I'm speaking to somebody here today who may even be feeling unloved or not qualified. Your lack of qualification for love does not make God stop loving you. At his realm, he can recognize your lack of qualification, but it, it, it doesn't have power over him to stop loving because he doesn't have a choice than to love. Yeah, that's his nature. And it doesn't go contrary to nature. Glory be to Jesus. It doesn't go contrary to nature. What God wants to create all of the time is a no judgment zone around everyone that he created. A no judgment zone. A judgment zone. A no judgment zone. John 8, I think verse 15, Jesus asked a woman caught in adultery and people gathered to judge her. She was seeking for something. She was seeking for love, but her interpretation of love was sex. And it, 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 it went bad. She was caught in adultery. The man, they let go of the man, obviously he's a kind of uh, society that's similar to ours, you know, chauvinistic kind of, where men have the right to do anything, you know, <laughs> you know, men can marry ten wives, 
but a woman cannot marry ten husbands. I'm not going there today. <laughs> Let's reserve it for another day. <laughs> and I'm not saying that men should marry ten wives. I'm just saying the way our society has been configured. Because this woman was caught in adultery, but it's only the woman that they brought to Jesus. And they had their stones in their hand. Moses said we should stone her. Yeah. She made a bad mistake. Terrible mistake. Yeah. But they made a more terrible mistake by bringing her to the God of love. Are you still with me today? To the God of love. Jesus created a no judgment zone around her. After, she, after he asked them, is there any of you who have not committed a sin before? If you haven't, and the Bible says from the oldest, because the oldest have more sins. They've lived for longer. So from the oldest to the youngest, they started dropping their stones and walking away. Yeah. Because some people have load, load, you know. Somebody that is 60 years old. <laughs> Apologies to all our old people in the house today. I'm talking about them, not you. <laughs> because I was just wondering why the Bible says that from the oldest to the youngest, they started from the oldest. Uh, the only calculation that makes sense is that uh, maybe they had more. Yeah. So, and when they had all gone, Jesus looked around and said, <laughs> uh, and asked, uh, where are your accusers? Ask the question, ask the woman, where are your accusers? And he said, no, nobody, nobody is present. Jesus said, don't worry, you can go. Neither do I condemn you. You can go. And that's the kind of zone that Jesus wants to create around us from time to time. But it's our responsibility, first and foremost, to understand that we are created for connection, not isolation. That we are created to receive love and to give love. The greatest commandment, according to Jesus, is that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. But one important thing that we all need to be aware of is that once your capacity for love is damaged, your ability to express your divine nature is compromised. Once your capacity for love is damaged, your ability to express your divine nature is compromised. It's compromised. It's compromised. Once your capacity for love is damaged, that, that nature of God that is in you can be injured. Situations and circumstances in life, life experiences, uh, uh, wants to hinder your capacity to give love or to receive love. But God's original intention is that you will live after his kind, which is that you will be able to give and receive love freely. Give and receive love freely. And this world, in this world, offenses will abound. According to Luke 17 and verse 1, Jesus made it clear, unequivocal. As far as this word exists, Jesus said to his disciples, uh, in the Amplified Translation, it says, stumbling blocks, temptations, and traps set to lure one to sin are sure to come. But woe, judgment is coming to him through whom they come. In New King, in, in New King James, it says, offenses will come. But woe to him through whom offense will come. But in this world, the things that will seek to derail us from unleashing the capacity to love and the capacity to receive love will abound. People will hurt you. People will lie to you or lie about you. Even in church, there's supposed to be holy ground. Yeah. People will gossip about you. Though in this church, we don't gossip. We don't gossip. We say it all the time. Some people, God is still helping them. But it's a family where gossip is not allowed. Yeah. Because we, be, we know that the people who gossip with you will gossip about you. And devil, the devil can use a gossiper more than he can use a worshiper. <laughs> he can't even use a worshiper. He's always looking for gossipers to use. And that's what destroys the family of God. That's what destroys the family of God. And that's what destroys even our natural families. Glory be to God. But I've come to say to somebody here today that the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is to enable your capacity to give and to receive love freely. 
That's, that's, uh, so the Holy Spirit is not given to us uh, just to speak in tongues and feel good. Yeah. It's to enable our capacity to exempt, I mean, to show forth our love nature. Romans 5 and verse 5. Yeah, Romans 5 and verse 5. The Bible says, There that now hope does not disappoint. It says, Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our heart by the Holy Spirit whom God has given to us. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our heart by the Holy Spirit whom God has given to us. Is there somebody in this house today struggling because of what you have gone through to be able to receive love or to give love again? You know, when you have uh, suffered from love and when you have been disappointed severally, rather than building bridges, you start to mount up fences. That's, how, that's what we do. Rather than building bridges, we start to mount up fences. God wants us to continue to build bridges. We are created for connection, not isolation. But when we have suffered pain, something just goes on in our mind that tells us if you are going to build anything at all, it should not be a bridge. It should be a fence. Wall up your life. Wall up yourself. Build fences around you. You have the responsibility to protect yourself from hurt, from abuse, from this and that. And I agree with you. You have the responsibility to protect yourself. But it's not in the perfect will of God for you to go around everywhere with fences mounted up all around you. To the point that it's even difficult for God to send people to you and they will be able to connect with you. And fine, God recognizes that you have gone through a bit. You have gone through a lot. You have been disappointed at work, disappointed within family. You've struggled with one or two relationships. Or somebody may be, even be listening to me right now. A marriage may have failed in your hand. Yet the love of God has not failed in your life. Are you still with me today? And what God wants is not that you go around everywhere, mounting fences all around you, but God wants you to build bridges. He wants you to build bridges. So what has happened that has diminished your capacity to give and receive love unconditionally? Are there things that have happened? Are there things that have happened? I'm speaking to somebody online. Are there things that have happened that you need to reckon with as real events, not imaginary? They didn't happen in your dreams. They happen in real life. Those things have diminished your capacity to give love or to receive love. Because except you identify them and reckon with them, you cannot seek the help of God to deal with them. You know, some people are living a disconnected life. You have multiple incidences, multiple things that have happened to you, but you have chosen to blank them out. That are human beings, you don't want anybody to talk about them around you. You know, some people cannot hear. If you hear somebody who is a namesake of their ex, they take a different direction. Just that somebody, you know, your ex is James, and you just say somebody there is calling, hey, James, just that you hear that, you take this direction. Yeah. Because there are names that remind you of things you don't ever want to remember. Am I saying the truth? Yeah. And that's how some people are living, and God is saying, no, you, you can't keep running. You can't keep running from love. You can't keep running from me. I am love. Because in, in the same way you are running from God, thinking that you are running from human beings or running from situations and circumstances. Let me wrap this up. In John chapter 4, we read the story of the woman at the well. She had situations, circumstances, and human beings that remind her of the things that she doesn't want to ever remember. And in verse 3 of John chapter 4, the Bible says that Jesus, having, you know, uh, be become tired and thirsty, spoke to, where did you hear 13 from? Verse 3. <laughs> So the Bible says that Jesus left Judea and departed again to Galilee. Verse 4, quickly, quickly. But he needed to go through Samaria. Verse 4. So he came to a city. Came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob 
gave to his son, Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now, this passage is to demonstrate to somebody that God can never be weary of chasing after you. Yeah. Jesus was tired and all that, but he still kept that up destiny appointment with that woman at a particular location by the well. Yeah. The disciples have gone to buy food. He could have gone somewhere else. He knew that the well was deep. There was nothing to, 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 to pick what up with, but it was there. Because somebody is right here or online who is thinking, you know, my own situation, God is not interested in it. I've messed up so much. All the opportunities I've had in my life I think God is on a recess. When is okay? When God has recouped, he will come back. Because I've finished all the love. The, my quota has finished. God has to reload it, and then we can maybe look for opportunities again. No. Jesus was there waiting for this woman, knowing that, because the Bible says in the earlier verse, that he, he knew that he must pass through Samaria. So he stayed by the well there and just waiting. Now a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. The woman was astonished. Yeah. Verse 8 says, the disciples have gone to buy bread, but yeah. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it? You being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. What this woman was saying was that young man or old man, I mean, it was maybe 32 or 33 at that point, it was a young man. Young man, behave. We know your type. For you to cross the divide between Jews and Samaritans to talk to me is not water. People don't ask for water just to talk to Samaritans. You need something. Say it. In her mind, they have come again. Amen. Because she has had encounters. Encounters. To the point where she, does, she didn't even think that she still has a capacity to give love. She's just looking for love everywhere. She was famished in her capacity to, to be a blessing to anybody or to steal. Jesus looked at her and saw something different. Saw somebody that God loves to beat. This woman told Jesus, the issue I'm dealing with is very deep. They're asking for water. Where are we going to get anything to draw with? The water is deep. I mean, the well is deep, you know, and all that. Some people feel like, sometimes this, this looks hopeless. There's nothing to draw with. God, what are you talking about? You know, that I can still love or that you love me. How do you really love me? And Jesus said, look, what I want to give to you is a kind of water that if you draw it out and drink, you will never be thirsty again. There are people listening to me today. You have been living on crutches emotionally. It's just something that keeps you going. Something that keeps you going. And you know, the woman, after Jesus started to move in the, in, the, in the supernatural and spoke to her and need, mentioned one thing, just one button. And I believe God wants to press one button in somebody's heart here today. All Jesus had to do was just to ask the question. After all the argument, he said, go and call your husband. Or where is your husband? The woman said, husband? You know, it's okay for people to come to church and go back. But let's not talk about the real issues. Let's just get around them. That was what the woman was expecting. Let's just talk around it, size this guy out. Oh, the guy is not interested in me. Okay, he wants to talk to me about religion. Okay, okay. But the moment Jesus mentioned husband, that was the real issue. She has been looking for love all her life. She's been with five men. Now she has a fear of commitment. She was just living with the sixth man. Jesus said, looked at her, where's your husband? The woman said, I have no husband. I said, you are right. You don't have a husband. The person that you are living with right now, you are not married to him. And that's your sixth person. The woman looked at Jesus and said, God must have sent it to me. You must be a prophet to have known this. Can I tell somebody this season? You are moving away from your season of reaction to your season of revelation. Amen. Where God will be revealing things to you. Through his word, through his servant, through music, through everything. You just know that God is reaching out to you. You know, you, you can't continue to live life by reaction. Building fences all around you. 
you know, uh, keep one animosity there, keep one hatred there, make up your mind. You, some people have policies. Their policy document is not written, you know, but it's in their heart. You don't talk to anybody that's from the East. Their people are not okay. You know, all kinds of things. They have all kinds of things. There are policies that have been wired into themselves. Yeah. Anybody that has here that is, uh, you know, somehow, one Esther, don't talk to them. All kinds of things. This woman was like, you, a Jew, talking to me, a Samaritan? I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. Yeah. And you don't know who God wants to send to you. And God says, I'm always chasing after you. I want to awaken my nature in you. Whatever wants to kill the nature of God, which is love in you, the Holy Spirit has been sent to you to stop the devil in his tracks. If there's anyone here today with a broken heart, with anything that has you know, that's seeking to hinder your capacity to love or to receive love. To love or to be loved. Notwithstanding what you have faced in time past, I just came to announce to you today that as we celebrate the love of God as in Christ Jesus, chains are broken. The walls are coming down. I say it again, I say the walls are coming down. I say it again, I say the walls are coming down. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Will you rise on your feet with me, everyone? Rise on your feet. Rise on your feet. Can you put my confession on the screen quickly from First Corinthians 13, verse 4? I need to pray. I need some time to pray. That's why I need to call you short. I need some time to, to pray. Because we want the Holy Spirit to touch people here this morning. There's healing in this house. Yeah, yeah. There's healing in this house. With your name on it. Yeah. There's healing in this house with your name on it. And beyond any gift that anybody can give you this season, there's something coming from heaven with your name on it. And you should not miss it. Yeah. A perfume is okay. You know, a bathrobe is okay. Whatever is okay. But what about a gift? A gift from heaven that heals your heart. A gift from heaven that causes you to manifest the nature of God in a new dimension. I wanted to say this after me before we pray. And this is, this is how we, uh, the love of God is, is demonstrated in us. This is how it is released in us. Yeah, this is how it is released in us. You know, you know uh, uh, in 1 John, just before we take this, you know, in 1 John 3 and verse 17, the writer of the book of John made a statement in King James, if you can put the King James Version up for me quickly, 1 John 3 and 17, quickly, and then we'll take this confession. Who is on the system? First John 3 and 17. Quickly, quickly. But whoever, I said King James, whoever has the words, yeah, whosoever has the words good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth off his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? This is what I'm trying to say. There's a point that we can get to, you and I, based on our experiences, the hurt that we've gone through, that we actually can shut down something in us. Yeah. Intentionally. Because the Bible talks about uh, uh, somebody who sees someone in need and shuts his bowel of compassion. And there are many Christians whose capacity to love has been shut down. So you see cat and mouse marriages. Though the two people speak in tongues. Yeah. You see somebody who speaks in tongues and prophesies but still slaps the spouse. The bowel of compassion has been shut down. So it's not only in gift giving or helping people, even within family. Yeah. Where the capacity to love and to give love has been terminated just because we've gone through certain things. That's what we want to trust God for today. That God will reactivate that capacity. Whatever bowels of compassion, bowels of love, bowels of intimacy has been shut down that there will be a divine reactivation. Can I get a good amen? amen? Can I get an amen from people online? Write it, amen. amen. Yeah. Because God is unleashing that power. Open up every power that has been shut down. Yeah. I wanted to say after me, let's go back to the confession quickly and then we're going to pray. Quickly, 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 guys. Glory be to Jesus. We'll take the confession from the Amplified Version of First Corinthians 13. Say, I endure with patience and serenity 
I am kind and thoughtful. I'm not jealous or envious. I do not brag and I'm not proud or arrogant. Say, I'm not rude nor self-seeking. I'm not easily provoked nor overly sensitive and easily angered. I do not take into account a wrong endured. I do not rejoice in injustice, but rejoice with the truth when right and truth prevail. I bear all things regardless of what comes. Believe all things, looking for the best in each other. Hope all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times. Endures all things without weakening. I pray over you today, your love will no longer buckle. Your love will no longer fail. In the name of the Lord Jesus, wherever love has failed or failed you, in the name of Jesus, we receive over such a person right now the hand of God. And we decree that the hand of God is taking you out of, that, out of that pit. The pit of despondency. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. I Lord pray for some people here, maybe also online. This is what I hear in my spirit. So I was praying about this service. I hear wounds and scars. Wounds and scars. Wounds. When they're still festering, they hinder capacity for action. There are people who are struggling to do certain things, struggling to unleash your bowel of love or compassion, struggling to connect. You know, you just want to shut down a particular area of your life because of a wound that is injuring you. You know, when somebody has suffered a fracture, it's difficult to move that leg. If you touch it, it brings a lot of pain. Somebody is at that point right now, and I want to pray for you. Another set of people is a scar. The scar reminds you of something that happened in the past. You have been healed, but the scar is still very strong. A scar is, is a signpost of a past experience uh, that seeks to hinder you from being able to move in the right direction. God wants to heal the wound and help you to forget the pain of the past. Scars can be traumatizing. And somebody here living with trauma, trauma, yeah. The pain is no longer there, but the trauma is still there. Because some people think, you know, I don't feel, the pain. it doesn't pain me again, you know, but the trauma, yeah, and the scar. Will you lift your two hands to Jesus today? For the next five minutes, I see the Holy Spirit doing a quick walk in this house. And anybody who is ready to receive, whether online or here in person, lift your two hands to Jesus. He is the healer. Don't look to a man today. Look to God. Look to God. Look to God. He is the healer. He is the healer. The Bible calls him the balm in Gilead. He is the physician, the ultimate physician. He heals, he sets free, he delivers. When God heals a pain, no devil, no devil can torment with that same pain again. Lift your two hands to Jesus today. Say, Father, heal my heart. If you're the kind of person I just spoke about, that's a wound, I want you to just put your hand, your, 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 your hand or your forehead, if you're that kind of a person, that's a wound that you need God to heal. Or somebody who just needs God to, to help you forget about this car, this thing that you see, and it reminds you of that, that traumatic experience. Uh, that thing can no longer continue to be a part of your life. The scar can be there. Sometimes the scar can be a child. Sometimes the scar, you know, uh, uh, can be anything. But God wants to turn what the enemy meant for evil to good in your life. Put your right hand on your head, on your forehead. I'm going to pray for you. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. You know our name. You know our thoughts. You know where we are being. You know everything about us. So I pray for anyone online, anyone right in this room, 
seeking you for healing right now. And I decree right now that your healing power flows into their life. Now, in the name of Jesus, we stand against whatever is aiding the wound to fester. We decree right now that the hand of God comes upon that wound for healing in the name of Jesus. Satan will stand against you. We break the hold of the spirit of lies. We receive for everyone a new perspective concerning the situation. If there's a truth that you need to know, a fact that has eluded you concerning that situation, I speak over your life right now. Enter into a season of revelation knowledge. My God will reveal things to you beyond your brain in the name of Jesus. You will have encounters in the dream of the night that will show you what God is doing in that situation. In the name of the Lord Jesus, Father, I ask that you send counselors, helpers, and interpreters to everyone who needs to interpret the situation better that their healing may come faster. We decree that interpreters are released in your direction. In the name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray for anyone who may still be nursing a memory of the past because of his car. The God who helps us to forget. He said, you shall not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. I pray that that same God put his hand upon you right now. No more reproach in the name of Jesus. Shame is taken away from your life in the name of Jesus. And we ask, Father, and everyone lift your two hands to Jesus, whether you are here or online. Say, Father, fill my heart afresh with your spirit. The Bible says in Romans 5 and verse 5, hope does not disappoint, for the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, will you fill us up afresh? Wave those hands to him all over this place. Lord, we receive a fresh infilling of your spirit over anyone, everyone in this service, everyone joining online, we receive a fresh infilling of your spirit that your love may pervade and permeate our hearts. And we thank you for new beginnings in marital destinies. Thank you because the walls are coming down and the bridges are being built right now. Thank you because the walls are coming down and the bridges are being built right now. We thank you, everlasting Father, in the precious name of Jesus. Glory be to Jesus. Please, you can, you can just take your seat quietly. Thank you. If you want to clap, I want you to do it very well. Do it very well. Praise God.